re rekindle my prayer life, get back in touch with Jesus, and. Uh, had, had that been spurred on by the the uh, parallel evangelical groups on campus? Had that been a part of it for you? No, it was really just a realization that uh, that I had I, I believed in God, I believed in Christ, I believed in the Scriptures. Uh, I had let my prayer life slip for a few years. I needed to come back to the Lord and and rekindle that relationship that I had that I had let go that had been part of my childhood. Um, and so that's when I, I came back into the practice of the faith in college. Um, I uh, met a lovely young lady when I was in college. She eventually became my fiance, and fortunately today she's my wife. <laughs> and uh, she started going to church with me. And and we uh, were at a secular university at the time, and we mutually realized that this university was not conducive to the practice of the Christian faith, and it would be a good idea to seek out a new place to go to school. And uh, we elected to go to Wheaton College, oh, which is sure. an evangelical Christian school in in Illinois. And, uh, and just to, again, to point out to the audience, not everyone listening realizes that to an evangelical, Wheaton is a household word. That's right. I mean, it that's is, right. I, I almost hate to use the word Mecca, but I mean, it is the the uh, touchstone of evangelical America in terms of college level. I mean, that's, yeah. That, that was a major consideration. Yeah. And uh, went to Wheaton College, uh, transferred there in my sophomore year, and began to study theology from really, as you pointed out, the, the finest yeah. Protestant teachers of the faith. The very pious, devout, they love Christ, very, very intelligent, very well educated people, knew the Protestant tradition, knew the Bible very well, began to study the faith intensely with these men and women. And ironically, this is really the beginning <laughs> of my journey to the Catholic Church. <laughs> and as you said, it was the last thing I ever thought I would ever do because one of the corollaries of this Protestant upbringing was that the Catholic Church was the Antichrist. I mean, it was, yeah. it, it really was the Church of Satan. We considered well, it. In your particular, and you know, I hope that any of the audience that's watched the Journey Home program over the years realizes that just to say, what do Presbyterians believe? Well, there's no simple answer to that. I mean, there's a complete gambit from the most liberal Christian viewpoints to the most conservative, all within Presbyterianism. You That's were right. of that sliver of extremely conservative Southern Presbyterianism that not only did you assume the Catholic Church was wrong, but you probably heard it from the pulpit, right? Uh, oh, yes. Well, mo honestly, more from the missionaries, the teachers in the schools, uh, the, the whole culture of the church was very, very anti-Catholic. Mm. Um, I don't remember that many sermons from the pulpit specifically attacking the Catholic Church, but you didn't need to because yeah. we, we would always have people come into the church. A lot of ex-Catholics would come to the church and you would always ask them, oh, well, were you raised a Christian? Oh, no, I wasn't a Christian. I was a Catholic. You know, but then I came into the Presbyterian Church and saw the light. So that was the whole culture of the church yeah. that you weren't a real Christian if you were a Catholic. And so I, I, that was the last thing in the world I anticipated. Um, so I began to study the faith in depth, and I really fell in love with the study of theology in, in sacred scripture, and uh, finished school, got married, um, spent one year in the working world, and uh, decided with my wife's consent that I really wanted to go to seminary. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to commit my, my life to the study of theology. And truthfully, one of my major goals was to combat the Catholic Church. And I considered it my, my duty as an evangelical Protestant theologian to show that the Reformation was, was correct, was on sound footing, and that the Catholic Church was in error. That was my objective. And you would have believed then that if you would have converted a Catholic to the Protestant faith, to the evangelical faith, that you were doing them a great service. Absolutely, absolutely. And in, in fact, converting a Catholic to the faith was, was almost the highest form of spirituality I could practice. And I can remember being in a, in a class when I was preparing for my graduate school, a GRE prep class. Yeah. There was a Catholic girl in the class with me and I found out she was Catholic and I pounced. You know? <laughs> and uh, one of my great regrets is I, I think I persuaded her at yeah. that time of my point of view. And I, I pray to God that that, that, didn't, that didn't keep, yeah. you know, that, that yeah. didn't take. But, um, oh yes, we definitely wanted to, wanted to go after the Catholics. And uh, so I went to seminary. I went to Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, which 
is another one of those flagship evangelical institutions. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if you come from the evangelical world, there'd be a lot of theologians and biblical scholars whose names you would know who would be associated with that institution. And uh, I studied my Greek, studied scripture, learned the Bible very well, um, uh, and began the study of church history uh, in depth and ended up majoring in church history. And my plan all along had been not, not pastoral ministry, but to go into teaching earned my PhD, and I thought one day I would be a seminary professor or a college teacher and that I would be teaching church history. And my main objective in teaching church history was to justify the Reformation. So I left, I left Trinity with that mindset and, and still very, very anti-Catholic, very anti-Catholic. Uh, can I ask a question certainly. there about the history? Because when I went to seminary, Protestant seminary, and studied church history, we jokingly say that that we pretty much jumped from the apostles to Martin Luther <coughs> and then learned it from there. Uh, you majored in history. Did, right. did you get a bit more than that, than uh, the usual? Did you actually read some of the t fathers? Did you read Augustine? And I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you. W one of the things that is part and parcel of Protestant identity is the notion that the early church was sound and that it's, we're not, never told exactly what we mean by the early church, okay? We don't know when early church falls away, but at some point, the church allegedly falls away from the purity of the gospel, only to be recovered by Martin Luther in the 16th century. Mm. Um, and so that's part and parcel of the, of the storyline. Now, when you get to seminary and you begin to study, and you really press and say, okay, well, who were these early Christians, all right? The, the only answer that you're ever given, they love the church father, Augustine of Hippo. They love Augustine because Augustine has a very high doctrine of grace. Mm -hmm. He loves the Bible, um, and, and they think they find some commonalities in Augustine. So our study of the fathers in seminary really majored on, on a few themes when we could find areas of commonality, and particularly in Augustine in his battle with the Pelagian heretics over the issues of grace and justification and salvation. They would gravitate towards those issues, and they would always interpret them with a very Protestant slant. So that, that's really my exposure at this stage of my education to the fathers. Because um, I think I remember using a textbook from one of the professors at Trinity. Um, I could guess his name, but maybe I shouldn't use it here, but it was a book on historical theology mm -hmm. in which he took themes, the Lord's Supper or salvation, and looked at it historically. But it was, when I look back, it was proof texting. It was proof texting. That's picking right. from Augustine or maybe whatever father that, that a, a text from their writings that was in line with the way we presently view or at least see the trajectory of it. That's right. That's right. Uh, definitely so. So, um, but I, I did very well in graduate school and, uh, and felt very confident about my future in theology and, and uh, I left and went to the University of Iowa that has a, an outstanding department of religion and uh, began my PhD studies in historical theology. They would call it history of religious thought, okay. you know, but it was yeah. essentially historical theology. And I elected to focus on, once again, the Reformation mm -hmm. and particularly the, the thought and the writings of John Calvin. I grew up a Presbyterian and Calvin was our man. And we liked Luther fine, but Calvin was the one who'd really gotten it right, and at least as we saw it. Mm -hmm. So I thought this, there's no better preparation from my future career than to immerse myself in the writings of Calvin and all the, all the while to continue my scripture study. Uh, as I have occasion to study the fathers, particularly Augustine, I need to learn Luther very well. Uh, uh, and uh, I think I should probably dip my toe into some medieval Catholic theologians, St. Thomas of Aquinas, uh, Duns Scotus, mm -hmm. um, and then some American theologians that were important evangelicals like Jonathan Edwards. So mm -hmm. I really wanted to prepare my pedigree to be the perfect Protestant theology professor, learn all the, all the sources of the Protestant faith. Um, and I was rudely awakened during that process. Um, I, I studied everything that I was supposed to study, and the first hint that something wasn't right was when I really began to dive into Augustine of Hippo. He's a Catholic doctor of the church, uh, but he's the, he is the one church father to whom the Protestants point above all as this is the one guy who believed like we do. And I read thousands and thousands of pages of Augustine, and I took comprehensive exams in Augustine, and I 
learned Augustine. And I came to the shocking discovery that, lo and behold, Augustine was a Catholic. And when I looked at his views of salvation and justification, uh, they were Catholic. I, I put them side to side with the Council of Trent. They were Catholic. I put them side to side with the writings of Thomas Aquinas. They were Catholic. And, and I realized that the, that the unique Protestant accents that Luther put on justification and salvation, particularly faith alone, were utterly absent in the mind of St. Augustine, mm -hmm. utterly absent. And, and in fact, his, his views were anathematized, rejected mm -hmm. by the reformers, not by name, they didn't reject Augustine, right. but his views. So this bothered me, and I began to look deeper into, well, if it's not Augustine, maybe there's somebody earlier Maybe, the, maybe Augustine lost it, but someone else had it correct. See, I, was, I was wondering because uh, the assumption behind so many Protestant faiths is that the early church was all right. That's but right. at some point in time it got, it, 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 it encountered a fork in the road and took the wrong fork. All right. And some push it all the way to Leo the Great, who, which would have been after Augustine. Right. Right. So you could push, well, Augustine had some good things, but he had all that burden on his back. And so were you thinking that? Were you looking for, is there, was there an earlier time or a later time? I can time? remember specifically the, the day I figured out that Augustine was a Catholic and that he really, really did not hold to Luther's views, I, rushing in and finding a Lutheran friend of mine and saying, where do I go now? What, what father should I read? You know, where do I, and he didn't have an answer. Hmm. But I, you know, I began to look and uh, went back to the third century, the second century, and and it was even more terrifying, because the earlier I went, the less like Protestants they looked. <laughs> and, and, and the doctrine of the, of the second century church was even farther removed from Luther. So then I thought, well, maybe I need to re-examine the writings of St. Paul. So I'm going to go back to my Greek text. I'm going to go back to the Bible. I'm going to look at Scripture itself and see, can I, can I find Luther in the writings of St. Paul? And, and I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the authorities, I'm going to get all the helps I can, I'm going to look at the Greek text, but I'm going to look at Protestant biblical scholars, I'm not going to look at any Catholics. I really want to convince myself of the truth of the Lutheran position on Scripture. So I, I go find Protestant biblical scholars. And I happen across this, this movement called the New Perspectives on Paul, which is a movement in Protestant uh, biblical scholarship that attempts to interpret Paul in light of his Jewish context in the first century. And when I, and these are the first class biblical scholars, all of them Protestants, all of them with Protestant view of the Bible as the sole rule of faith. And I come to find out that the best in Protestant scholarship in the 20th century rejects Luther. And they're not entirely, they're not Catholics. Their point of view on Paul is not entirely Catholic, but they, they provided me with a framework for seeing that Paul, not, Paul also could not really truthfully and honestly be read from a Lutheran point of view. Luther misunderstood Paul. And so from, from the sources of the faith, from the fathers of the church, and from the best in Protestant scholarship, I eventually came to the position that justification by faith alone was a 16th century invention mm. by a Saxon monk who had left the church mm. and was no part of historic Christianity. Uh, and yet, I still didn't consider becoming Catholic, <laughs> but my faith was shaken. Can, can I ask uh, where your wife was in all this? Um, she was taking care of our kids. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, was, it was years, this, was, this process went on for years and sure. years, so it was a long time before she began to see that I was having some theological difficulties. Um, the, next, the next big challenge to my faith is, I sort of put that one on the back burner. I said, mm -hmm. well, I'll, I'll figure out justification later, okay. I was going to say, because that, that could be a career killer. It, it could very well be a career killer. And so I actually spent a few, a few years, how, how, can I, how can I work a, a nuanced version of this doctrine into my theology so that I can continue to be a Presbyterian and, and be employed at a Presbyterian <laughs> institution? You know? um, so I began to study the writings of the Reformers, and uh, Calvin especially, and Luther. And I have another rude awakening, and that is that the reformers themselves don't believe the doctrines that I was taught growing up. That there is a difference between evangelical American Christianity in the 20th century, 21st century, and the religion of 16th century Protestantism. And specifically, let's, let's go to the, the doctrine of being born again, inviting Jesus into your heart. You have to be born again. 
Um, this is absent. This is completely absent from the writings of Calvin or Luther. Both of them assumed that Christian life begins with baptism. Now their understanding of baptism wasn't entirely Catholic. They had some things right, they had some things wrong, but they all agreed Christian life begins at baptism. And uh, you can read all of Calvin and you will not find one exhortation to a Christian audience that anyone in there should be born again. The assumption is they are, they are, okay. And uh, I looked at the doctrine of sola scriptura, which you know I always thought that meant, okay, I need to read the Bible and find out if these doctrines that I'm being taught are true. That's what I had done with justification. And I come to find out that this is not how sola scriptura, the Bible alone, was applied in the 16th century. In fact, Calvin specifically had a very high view of his own divine authority to interpret the Bible. <laughs> and in fact, uh, strongly opposed the laity in his own church, challenging his authority to interpret scripture <laughs> or coming to different interpretations. Yeah. And there was a, a very celebrated controversy in his lifetime with a, with a fellow by the name of Bolsick over the doctrine of predestination. And he was arguing with Calvin about predestination. But for me, the most interesting thing about that conflict wasn't predestination. It was the assumption about who has the right to interpret scripture. And when you read Calvin's responses, that's what really upset him. It was that a layman would dare to challenge his right to interpret the Bible hmm. with authority. And I began to see, okay, this, this, this notion of church authority and, and sola scriptura, the way we live that in 20th century America is different from the way they lived it in the Reformation. Mm. So, I was going to say the two things there that also, uh, even the fine tune, which I, I just, which get me as I understand my own Presbyterian background, was number one, this born again issue. Well, I mean, Calvin's view of predestination and not knowing who the elect were and the different the different uh, shades of the way Presbyterians have understood that double predestination for some. Uh, I mean, they're all quite a bit different than being born again. Born again, you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Right. You know, well, Calvin's view is, is, for some of them, some of the different Calvinist views, were that that's, some people would know to the, your whole life whether you're of the elect or not, these different views of that. And the other one you, you, uh, you just mentioned, uh, the whole issue of... Um, uh, what was the second issue you just mentioned? The second we, we, the, their interpretation of Scripture. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I mean, the, the two volume institutes, when you read Calvin's institutes and his strong, almost arrogant at times saying, this is the way it's, it's understood as he writes out his institutes in interpretation right. of Scripture. The, to differ with that, you're in trouble. There, you there are a number of places in Calvin, you don't, you don't hear these in the Presbyterian Church today, but when I got into the sources where he, he claims to be a prophet, he claims to speak with divine authority. He, he, he believes very strongly in the necessity of ordination, for, but except in his own case, because he sees himself as having been specially elected by God for this role. He's been raised up like an apostle. This is the kind of language he uses with himself, okay? Um, there was another issue that I found very disturbing uh, in comparing my own evangelical upbringing to the reformers, and that had to do with ecclesiology beyond the, just the issue of authority, things like the sacraments, the Eucharist, mm -hmm. um, and uh, are these essential parts of the Christian faith or are they non-essentials? Can we dispense with them? And growing up, our view was if someone was born again, they believed in salvation by faith alone, uh, they believed in the Bible as the sole rule of faith, then, then they were in. Mm -hmm. And if they disagreed on baptism or the Lord's Supper or church government, uh, these were non-essential issues and you could just let them pass. That was a really key element of evangelical faith. And we actually prided ourselves on not building up walls between Presbyterians or Methodists or Baptists. We're all just brothers in the Lord. When I went back to the 16th century, I discovered that that was not at all the view of the reformers. Uh, Calvin actually says in one little treatise he writes in the 1540s that a proper understanding of the Eucharist is necessary for salvation. Hmm. All right? And as you know, Luther uh, wanted to go to war over the issue of the Eucharist rather than join with the Zwinglians, which is a reformed theologian, and the Swiss over what he held to be a heretical doctrine of the Eucharist. He thought the Reformed Church, the Calvinists, were worse than the Catholics. All right? So these issues to the Protestants, were they were life or death issues. And once again, I woke up and realized, are they life or death issues? I've always thought that these are variable and they don't matter and they're inessential. But here, my own forefathers are telling me 
the, the nature of the Eucharist, baptism, church authority, all of these are issues that are worth dying for and worth killing for. Mm. All right. Um, do I need to re-examine these issues? Now, I'm getting very worried at this point. I'm getting very worried at this point. 